Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our meeting of Monday, January 17th. Uh, we started a little bit late and with a few technical issues today, but I think we've got all the technical issues worked out and we're not gonna get over that last two minutes at the beginning of the meeting, but I promise not to talk too much and uh, try to uh, get through the full meeting. Um, a, our speaker for today is Tanya McCready. And I will pass control over to Malcolm to introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. Uh, on this snowy day, which is an appropriate uh, uh, temperature to be at for our speaker today. So first of all, I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine it's March the 5th, 2010 in Anchorage, Alaska. <clears throat> the temperature is minus 17 degrees and you're standing on the runners of your 16 team dog sled for the ceremonial start of your first 1500 kilometer journey journey in the classic Iditarod trail sled dog race in the roughest, most beautiful terrain mother nature has to offer. She throws jagged mountain ranges, frozen rivers, dense forests, desolate tundra and miles of windswept coast at you. You, the musher and your dog team are ready to go. Here to tell us about her musher husband, Hank De Bruins adventure is Tanya McCready from their dog bear and their dog's home in the Halliburton Highlands. Tanya, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Malcolm. And I don't know if you guys can see me. Yes, we Hopefully. can. There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, gosh, I mean, Hank and my journey into the world of sled dogs started back in the mid nineties. We were living in Guelph at the time. I was going to the university there for engineering and my husband's a millwright by trade. He worked on dairy farms all over the province. One night after dinner, we made the simple decision to go to the mall. You know, seemingly such a meaningless decision. But I remember we walked through those mall doors and on our left-hand side was a pet store. And in that pet store was this adorable red and white husky puppy doing loops as fast as she could possibly go. Well, we had just got married, had two cats, no plans of getting a dog. But we went in and played with her for a bit and then continued on our way. Well, the next night after dinner found us back at the mall playing with that pup. And the third night again. And that night, that pup ended up coming home with us. And, you know, we thought we'd made the decision to add a dog to our family that night. What we didn't realize was we made a decision that was about to transform the entire trajectory of our lives. But in the short term, Colt was everything husky that we had no idea we just got ourselves into. So she ran away numerous times. She chased cats. She destroyed our apartment. So in desperation to understand what we had brought into our lives, we got every book we could find on huskies. One of those books was called Race Across Alaska by Libby Riddles. Well, when we finished that book, which was about Libby's first to did her odd win, we not only had fallen in love with Alaska, the history and the culture behind this amazing breed of dog, but also the Iditarod. So we found out Huskies were pack animals. So Husky 2 Tundra joined our family. And while Colt was way happier, the mayhem probably quadrupled with the two of them. And then we saw a movie. There's usually a few that remember this movie. Late 1990s, a Disney movie called Iron Will. Anybody remember Iron Will? Sandy hands. Well, I highly recommend if you haven't seen, it's still on Disney. And it's a true story of a boy, early, early 1900s, who entered a dog sled race from Winnipeg to St. Paul, Minnesota. And he entered that race to save his mom's farm. Well, when we finished watching that movie, my husband looked at me and said, we have got to try dog sledding. So Ice and Lucy, Husky 3 and 4 joined our family. I bought Hank a sled and harnesses for the dogs for Christmas. We were dog sledders. In the evenings on weekends, we go out to Guelph Lake Conservation Area and just have a great time with our Huskies. But of course, four dogs is one team and we both like dog sledding. So it wasn't long before Storm joined our family, Midnight Mackenzie joined family. So we each had a team of dogs. And at this point I graduated engineering. So I was commuting Guelph to St. Catharines every day for work. Hank was still traveling the province. And I got to the point, it's like, we're just passing ships. This is not why we got married. My job wasn't going as I planned. Just the company had a great technology, but as we went from pilot scale to full scale, we found many problems with it. And things were being covered up as they tried to fix it, which wasn't working. And I got to the point, I literally felt sick going to work every day because making the environment worse is certainly not what it spent five years going to school for. So needless to say, we were looking for options. We both grew up on farms in the Thousand Islands and city life just really wasn't where we wanted to be. I remember one night on the phone, a friend said to us, why don't you turn your love for your dogs into a business? I remember we looked at each other and went, 
could we actually do that? The more we thought about it, the more we talked about it, the more excited we got. So we wrote a business plan. Now, I don't know if there are any bankers in this club, out of curiosity. Any bankers? I don't see any hands? Well, all I can say is in Southern Ontario, from vast experience, if you take a business plan into a bank, and I think we went to about 30, 40 of them that year, with a picture of a dog sled team on the front cover, it does not go well. We got the plan handed right back to us. We got it failed back with no notes. We just got no answers at all. So three months in, we're like, gosh, you know, maybe this wasn't such a great idea. And then out of the blue, we got a call from the Royal Bank in Huntsville. And to this day, I have no idea who, but someone had sent our business plan north. Well, they asked us to come for a meeting and we left that meeting. We had a signed small business loan. What we didn't know at the time was that bank manager was only a couple months away from retiring. We found out a year later, he had told the colleague that got his job, he goes, you know, I'm pretty sure this young couple is good for the money, but if it goes south, I'm out the door, it'll be your issue to deal with. So that was a vote of confidence that got us started in business. But September 1st, 1999, Hank and I quit our jobs, rented out our house in Guelph. I remember it was about eight o'clock that night, we handed our keys to our new tenants. Our two pickup trucks loaded with our seven dogs, our three cats trailer with all our belongings and we started the four hour drive north to our new home in Halliburton. And I don't know if you've ever drove between Bracebridge and Halliburton 118, but it is such a beautiful drive. So you get close to Halliburton and you enter the Highlands. And that night there was a full moon rising and it seemed like the most amazing omen for the new life we were starting. Even though when we got to our new home, <laughs> we knew things weren't quite as we'd hoped they would be. We thought we were so organized with our new house plans and our kennel but we'd come to find out nothing happens fast in Halliburton. So instead of those new buildings finished, all we drove home to that night was a big driveway that went up into the hills, two massive holes in the ground where those buildings should have been. No hydro, no water. Bell Canada had showed up on time. With no hills to install our phone, they had simply nailed the jack to a tree. So we had a phone on a tree and that was it. And to make things a bit more challenging, I was eight months pregnant with our first child. Now, to say our friends and family thought we'd lost our minds is a bit of an understatement, but Hank's from a huge Dutch family, and thankfully both of our families would show up as much as they could that fall and help us build as fast as we could possibly go. And, you know, we moved into a, we rented a dilapidated motor home from a local family, and that's what we brought our newborn son home to a month later. By early November, we realized there was no way we'd ever get the house done, so we made the decision to move into the kennel. It was done because we had more dogs joining our family, so we'd focused on it first. And I usually see some looks when I say we moved into the kennel, but our dogs are pretty spoiled. So they have radiant heat through their floor. They have a grooming room with a tub and a shower and full kitchen. So really, it was like a small apartment we moved into with our dogs. That allowed us to focus on our business then. And that winter, we got to welcome 300 guest dog sledding. A far cry from the normal 2,500 guests a year we welcome, but it proved to us we weren't crazy that people would come to the wilderness to share our love and our passion for our Huskies and traveling with them. And a year after we moved to Halliburton, we finally moved into our new log home where I'm standing today. And I've been asked so many times what kept us going that fall. When we had no home, winter was coming, no income, no hydro, no water, new baby. And I think it's two things. The first was we couldn't go back. We'd burned our bridges. Our jobs were gone. Our house was rented to a lovely family. Had our house been sitting empty that November, I'm not so sure at some point we would have said, you know what, this was a crazy idea. Let's just go back to the life we know. But when you can't go backwards, it forces you to become incredibly resourceful to find a way forward. And the other reason I say half jokingly, but also with all seriousness, Hank and I both never questioned our sanity on the same day. Days that he would be like, what have we done? <laughs> I would be like, it's all coming together. Like, here's what we've accomplished. We'll be here in another week. This is what we're building. And days that I would be questioning what we'd done, he would be that support for me. Because when you're building a big dream, chasing a big goal, most people don't see what you see. But having at least one person that shares that vision is so crucial because there's going to be tough days on that journey. The other reason we moved to Halliburton would as Hank had decided along the way, he wanted to run the Iditarod, as Malcolm mentioned. And we knew it would take time to build the business to the point we could afford for Hank to step back and focus on training one team of dogs. But the first weekend in March 2010 found us in Anchorage, Alaska. Hank and I, 16 of our dogs, our four children. And the best way I can explain the Iditarod is it is the biggest state party you can possibly imagine. 
It is a celebration of everything Alaskan. First day is a ceremonial start 13 miles through the streets of town, Anchorage city, not really a town. And I remember as we ran that race, there was vendors and tailgate parties and barbecues everywhere along the trail. And then on the Sunday, you go north to Wasilla, and that's where the race officially kicks off. There was 83 teams the year Hank ran, so you can imagine 83 teams, 16 dogs a team, that's over a thousand dogs on this lake. The teams go out on two minute intervals. So as you get close to the start, it is pandemonium. You can't hear yourself think the dogs are so excited. Hank's bib was in the mid forties. So finally it was our turn to get our team ready. Diderod sends about a dozen volunteers to help. And remember four kids trying to wrangle dogs were so excited. Finally, 16 dogs in harness on the line. Now to give you a feel, a 16 dog team is about as long as a tractor trailer. And while it is fast off the start, it's the power that's so incredible because it's 800 pounds a dog versus my husband's about 170 pounds. So finally, we watch the team in front of us go and it's our turn to pull under that big starting chute. 12 volunteers with leashes on dogs, my brother at the front, Hank and I both full weight on the brake of his sled. And I remember our two minute countdown started and Hank's routine is the same at every race. The first thing he does is he sinks these two huge hooks into the ground. They're called snow hooks, kind of like an emergency brake for a dog sled. Allows him to step away from the team. But as he does that, two massive guys crash to the ground and physically grab onto the sled because the dogs are just lunging and leaping to go. And Hank runs to the front of the team and he starts with his leaders. He gets down, connects with them eye to eye, ruffles their fur. And even though they don't speak the same language, you can literally feel the communication and the energy going back and forth between them. Quickly works his way back through all 16 team members till usually 30 seconds, he's back at the sled. Kids and I get a big bear hug. Love you. See and know, please be careful. 20 seconds, he's on the runners. As I wave everyone away from the dogs. And it doesn't matter how many times he's raced, I'll watch his hands literally shake like this as he reaches down to pull those two huge hooks out of the ground. Because at 800 pounds, he's about to unleash, he's not gonna control for 15 or 20 miles. The adrenaline, the energy, the instinct, the love of running wears off just a bit. And those dogs even remember he's back there. Five, four, three, two, one. And we watch him and the team rocket out of that starting shoot through snow fences lined with hundreds of spectators cheering them on as they cross the lake. Remember the kids and I stood and watched them go and they got to the far side and climbed the bank and disappeared into the Alaska wilderness. Our oldest boy was about 10 at the time and remember he looked up at me with this huge smile on his face and then he stopped and he goes, mom, why are you crying? He had grown up hearing about the Iditarod since he was born. He never questioned one day we would be there. For Hank and I, that moment was 13 years of chasing a dream. So the kids and I went back to Anchorage where we would stay and Hank and the team continued across Alaska. Every musher has a GPS tracker on their sled. It's of no use to them, but it allows the race and fans and friends, family to follow every team's progress. And even though I could see the team was moving well, I didn't sleep for the next three nights because I was so worried. Not about the dogs, because I know Hank would literally sacrifice himself to care for them. And there's also 50 veterinarians on that trail show you who the true stars of the race are as it should be. They're not a single medical doctor. So three days in, I couldn't take it anymore. My brother's like, just go, I'll keep the kids. And I booked a plane ticket to a little tiny place called McGrath, Alaska. Remember the day I landed, walked a mile to the community center as I got close, I saw our team. Our dogs stretched out in the straw in the sun, Hank with people around him laughing. I was like, oh, this is embarrassing. What was I so worried about? Mine can play such tricks. Of course, Hank didn't know I was coming, so we visited for a few hours, and then it was time for him and the team to continue on. I was stuck in McGrath, so the plane came back the next day. No hotels in McGrath, but the cafe kindly opens its doors during the race and lets people crash there. Even though I slept on a hard bench that night, I had a great sleep because I wasn't worried. Ironically, it was the night I should have been the most worried. What I didn't know was as the team had continued down the river, they got into some overflow that afternoon. Overflows just water that lays on top of the ice. Wasn't deep, the dogs were fine, but Hank had got his boots wet. 
As he got to the next checkpoint about eight o'clock that night, a tiny cabin, his plan had been to stay and dry his boots out. The volunteers there, not knowing he had wet feet, told him a couple teams had blown through a few hours before, had left the message they were going five miles up the trail, gonna have a huge fire tonight for everybody to come join them. The husband being a rookie, not wanting to inconvenience anyone, he said, okay, I'll keep going. He repacked his sled and headed out into the night. Got five miles, no sign of a fire. Another mile, still no fire. And then he realized he was in trouble because he couldn't feel his feet anymore. So he stopped the team, he got them bedded down in straw, got them a hot meal, and then he knew he had to warm up. So he pulled out his big minus 40 sleeping bag. He was so cold, he couldn't get his boots or his outer gear off. So he crawled in with all of it still on. When he woke up, he realized he was in worse shape. He still couldn't feel his feet. He also couldn't feel his hands. He'd fallen asleep facing the zipper of the sleeping bag in between his breath and the frost in the air that night. The zipper was now a frozen block of ice as well. So he has no idea how long he laid there that night. He very clearly remembers the three thoughts that went through his mind. How am I gonna get out of the sleeping bag? I don't know if I'm gonna get out of the sleeping bag. I'm not getting out of the sleeping bag. And as he said, he laid there accepting that last thought. Thankfully, another thought went through his mind too. What will happen to my team if I don't get out? Now, of course, the dogs would have been fine. They're meant to be in Alaska. There's planes and snowmobiles travel the trail all the time during the daylight. Thankfully, in the middle of the night, that thought didn't occur to him. The tiniest bit of the toggle, the zipper was out of the ice and got it between his teeth and he started to work it back and forth until the ice started to crack. He was able to leverage his way out. He got to his feet and he started running because he knew he had to get warmed up. Just ran back and forth along the dogs who were curled up sleeping. He said their eyes followed him. Eventually he got pain back in his feet, his hands. And while he got frostbite that night, he was okay. We wrote a book after that race, but the story's not in that book. It was many years before my husband was willing to share it publicly. He felt it made him look like a fool, that he had no right to be on that trail when he made such a bad decision. He felt it questioned who he was as a person, that he put himself in a position that he couldn't care for his team. But in the last two years, we've shared that story a lot. It's what Hank learned so clearly that night when things get tough. No matter if your team is a team of sled dogs in the middle of Alaska, your club, your family, your church, your company, as a leader, by not taking care of yourself, you ultimately end up putting those you serve, those you love, those who need you the most in the biggest jeopardy. Well, Hank's gone on and run five more of these crazy races since, and he'll never take care of himself the way I would like him to. He darn well always makes sure he's fed, he's hydrated, he's warm, and that his mindset is strong to care for his team. So with your permission, I have a PowerPoint I'd love to share with you that We'll let you meet our Huskies and take you into Alaska with us. Thank you.
I'd rather stand on the edge of a cliff And hang my toes over a bit And then jump when they dare me Even if it scares me and I get hurt I'd rather build my wings on the way down Do my best not to fall to the ground And then laugh at my mistakes Cause they're only lessons I'll learn I guess I could just play it safe And forget about love, hope, and faith With my eye on the shoreline Keeping my boat tight and staying home Oh, but I'll never discover new land By keeping my feet on the sand No, I'd rather set sail and get carried away by the storm It's out of control Live my whole life with a sense of abandon Squeeze every drop out no matter what happens And I wonder what I've missed Oh, I just can't resist A chance to into our world a little bit and you know there's no pictures of crossing that first thousand mile finish line if you notice because he didn't get to he got about another 300 miles up the trail from the night I shared and got a call from the race marshal challenging his speed in the race by the end of that call he was no longer in the race I flew Hank and the team further up the trail that afternoon to the bigger hub of Unalakleet on the Bering Sea and then it took us a couple days to get them back home to, to Anchorage I remember when they landed, my husband got off that plane and looked at me and said, I just want to go home. I just want to leave Alaska. So our two young girls and I flew home and Hank and our boys started to drive across Canada with the dogs. Five days after I got home, that truck pulled up our driveway. I quickly realized the man that got out was a very different man than the one I'd left in Alaska. As you might imagine, not much stops my husband. He's kind of like a bear. That five-day drive. He'd come to see himself as a failure. Felt he'd failed me, our children, our dogs. Amazing small town that came out and helped raise money. The next month, he wouldn't leave our property. He wouldn't talk to his family on the phone. He got to the point he was hardly talking to me. 
I remember one late April morning, a beautiful spring day, we were sitting on our porch and saying nothing. I remember being so afraid for him. I knew he needed help and there was no way he would ever ask for it because he was so proud. So I said, Hank, what if, what if we run the Iditarod next year? You prove it wasn't you. It wasn't our dogs. He looked at me and said, there's no way now we're ever going back to that race. I said, okay, what about the Yukon Quest? Lesser known thousand mile race. Let's run that. For a second, he looked up and then he went, can't afford it. He was right. I also didn't know what else to do. So I said, I promise you, if you find, sign up for that race, we will find a way. And I saw the second he made up his mind. Because all of a sudden I had my husband back. Instead of being focused on what had happened, what had gone wrong as quote unquote failure, everything he couldn't change. He had a new dream, a new passion, a new reason to be excited to get out of bed in the morning again. Just on that PowerPoint, the team crossed that finish line that year. Officials and fans went away, and it was just us. He looked at me and grinned and said, You know, we have unfinished business on the Iditarod Trail. The next March found us back in Anchorage. And that year, the team crossed the finish line in Nome, Alaska. You know, that day we finished a dog sled race, a dream we had chased for 15 years. But what my husband taught our children, thousands of fans he gained along the way. Is the only true way to fail is to give up. So thank you for letting me join you today on this wonderful snowy day. I hope something I've shared has touched your heart or entertained you a bit, but I'd be honored to take any questions that anybody might have on our life with our dogs. Yes, so if anybody has a question, please use the raise hand icon or the raise hand uh, reaction in Zoom. John Everhart's there. Go ahead, John. Actually, I was just raised my hand in a clapping fashion for a wonderful presentation. And it was emotional. And I hope uh, your husband has come around to the point where he's still interested in taking tours, at least in the highlands of Halliburton. That would be good fun. That was a great adventure he was on. Thank you, John. And yes, they just literally headed out the door while I was talking to take some teams out this afternoon with some guests. So thank you. So Keith, you have a question. Yeah, so um, I've, I've seen uh, this some a number of years ago on television, uh, and I don't I actually don't think it's ever broadcast anymore, which you can maybe comment on. But my question has to do with uh, the medical care of the dogs um, that uh, they are they're checked regularly. And if there's any, any um, risk to a dog, it's removed. Have you experienced that in your time of racing, that your, your dogs uh, were under any uh, distress that they had to be removed? Um, I mean, it's very rare for a team, like you start with 16 dogs to finish a race with 16 dogs, because a thousand miles, of course, so much can happen. So, you know, the first thing is the dogs may decide they don't want to run anymore, which is totally fine. You know, the dogs, the only way the sled moves is the dog's desire to run. Um, so if a dog decides they don't want to go anymore, that's no problem. They're left in the checkpoint with the veterinarians and then they're flown back to their family in Anchorage. Um, dogs that get dropped for distress isn't the word I would use very often. I mean, occasionally there's a dog that might be in the distress, but normally it's soft tissues. So, you know, it might be a wrist that's sore or a shoulder are the two most common soft tissue injuries that a dog just, if it had 24 hours to recover with the team, it would be fine to go again. But mushers usually are only in checkpoints for six to eight hours, sometimes 12 hours. So if a dog is too sore you know, after that six or eight hours, then again, they're left with the vet team and then they're flown back to us in Anchorage. So certainly we've had some dogs with just sore wrists or shoulders that are flown back to us. Um, we've had some younger dogs that, you know, get halfway through and it's like, huh, this is a long run. I don't know if I want to keep going. And so they get flown back to us. But uh, the veterinarians on these trails, I mean, they're just, they're amazing people. They donate their time. They fly in with their own money um, to look after these dogs on the trail. So a lot of people are like, you know, do the veterinarians force mushers to drop dogs? I've never seen that happen. Um, normally what you see is a musher will come into a checkpoint and ask for a veterinarian to come over and say, I don't know what's wrong with this dog, but something's just off. And then from what the musher tells the veterinarian, they kind of reverse engineer and try to figure out what the issue is with the dog. I mean, mushers know their dogs so incredibly well. No veterinarian could know the dog that well just by an exam. So it's very much a partnership between the mushers and the veterinarians to care for these amazing dogs. 
hope that answers your question, Keith. I have a, I have a question, it. Tanya. Um, in the wintertime, I know you run the, oh. you can go on up to your, to the winter dance and, and take the dog sled runs. What do you do in the summertime when there's no snow? <laughs> the dogs just get to be dogs in the summer. So uh, we have three acres of play yards here that they go out in and play in every single day, whether it's winter or summer. And yeah, summertime is just, you know, for them a time to enjoy just being dogs. So it's too hot for them to work. Um, you know, some breeds of northern dogs have shorter coats than Siberians, but for our guys, 10 degrees is kind of our threshold for working temperatures and, and too hot. Um, so yeah, summers is just summer holidays for them. For us, we also do maple syrup. So we have farmers markets and we have some new remote cabins that we rent out in the summer, but uh, the dogs are just on holiday. And I, I sorry, go ahead, Rick. Uh, I'm interested to know, uh, Tanya, whether there were any after long-term effects for Hank with his feet and his hands. I mean, for, I've I've had frostbite, and it is not pretty, <laughs> and very very painful. So I I don't know whether he talked to you about that or whether there was any medical issues that he had to deal with once he once he got back to sort of civilization in a sense. Yeah, I mean, he never went and saw a doctor. Um, you know, my husband, <laughs> doctors aren't somebody he goes and visits very often, but um, certainly he had a ton of sensitivity and pain in his feet after that. Um, his feet, he has no long-term effects. Now his hands, because he's had frostbite more times than I can count in his hands, um, he has to be very careful with his hands now. So even on a day like today, he'll have hand warmers in his mitts and his gloves, just has to be so careful. Um, and most mushers that run those races, if they run them a couple times, have the same conditions. They just have to be super hypersensitive with their hands because it doesn't take much to get possible. John Finan? Yeah, Tanya, great presentation. Thank you for that. I, I think my children and I were up that way a number of years ago. I don't think we were at your business, but the place was called Chalk Paw. Was that a, mm. Is that a dog sledding operation that's still around? Um, uh, near it, Perry it, Sound. It, yeah, uh, Chalkpa was just um, South River Sundridge area, um, yeah. and they've yeah. unfortunately retired. It was an older couple okay. that that kennel. Yeah. I think uh, he sadly passed away. Oh. And then the wife just it was too much for her. I think she was in her mid seventies and had a lot of health challenges too. So. Oh. I think that was two summers ago now. Um, you know, there was a huge musher movement to adopt out all their dogs. So three of them ended up here and, you know, nice. they, they ended up all over North America, different kennels. So oh, all their good. dogs found new homes. Yeah. But yes, yeah, sadly, the, the business. Well, when, when my children were younger, we went up. I think I went with a niece on a school trip and then I thought my kids would like this. So for two years, we went up and I think it was about a five or six hour mush into the woods where we stayed in a in a tent of sorts, and then back the next day. Is that the kind of thing that you operate as well? Um, we do all same day tours, actually. Okay. Um, I mean, Chalkpaw certainly had, you know, the overnight multi-day package kind of tied up. Yeah. Um, and certainly while there's people that do <clears throat> enjoy that, for most people, that's a little bit too hardcore nowadays. Yeah. Uh, most people kind of like going out with us for three hours and then coming back to, you know, a nice fine dining and a hot tub. And um, so that's more what we do. There is still a company in Algonquin that does some overnights. But of course, I mean, we've all had problems with COVID. But for them, you know, putting different families in a tent, that's just not possible. So it's yeah, true. Back yeah. To well, even the, worse than the rest of us. Well, I was much younger. My kids were five and eight at the time. And it seemed like a really good idea until about an hour out. And then it was, yeah, challenging. Not, not, not nearly what Hank went through, but thanks for that. Absolutely. John De Actis. Hi, thanks for a great presentation. Very inspirational. Um, quick question for you. Uh, my assumption is it, it's not a cheap hobby <laughs> or, or a business. Do you have sponsors or how do you, you know, are you allowed to have sponsors in, in the race and so on? And how do you, how do you make do? For sure. Um, so teams are allowed to have sponsors and, and most teams that do thousand mile races do have sponsors. Um, a lot of times it's just individuals, you know, like um, everybody has different kind of setups, but um, we had it so people could sponsor one of the race teams. So, you know, I can't remember, it was 200 or 250 dollars. So most of our sponsors were just individual people that, you know, would buy a tank of fuel, which was a lot cheaper than it is today, or, um, you know, booties for the dogs or whatever. So that certainly helped probably the first mm -hmm. race, 20, 25% of the cost. Um, that second race, the Yukon Quest, that we didn't have the money to run. Uh, that race, we ended up oh, 
corporate sponsor signed up, um, just a friend of a friend of a friend, and the entire cost of that race was covered before we even left Halliburton that year. So, um, so yeah, most mushers do have sponsors to some degree, but usually a lot of the cost still comes out of pocket for most mushers. Uh, so most of us do not most half of us probably do tours as well and that helps offset the cost of racing because even the winner of the Iditarod basically breaks even they get a new pickup truck I think it's 40,000 cash um, when our first race cost us 50,000 and that's not the care of the dogs for the year that was just you know the cost to do that race. so yeah you, you don't do it for the money that's for sure yeah thank you for sure John Tanya, you just answered part of my question, but another part is this, uh, along with a bunch of crazies in January, uh, early February, we uh, do a winter camp up at Limberlost and we cross country ski and snowshoe. Is that close to where you are located? And is it possible to arrange for a group to come down and have a day of sledding with you? Um, for sure. So Limberlost is closer to Huntsville. We're Halliburton. So as the crow flies, it's not ridiculous, but by road, you got to do this huge, big square. So um, we're probably about an hour, approximately an hour drive from Limberlost, maybe a little bit less. Um, but yeah, definitely we have groups, well, a little bit harder now, but generally we have groups quite often that come in, you know, a corporate group or a social group, whatever, will come and do a, a tour for an afternoon or a morning with us. Good plan. And uh, is there a website where we get the uh directions and uh, telephone coordinates with you yeah for sure um, winterdance.com we're easy to find and yeah pretty much everything is on there Todd. good thank you of course well i think that's it for the questions and we've just about run out of time for questions as well um i would love to thank you tanya you are an incredible storyteller i don't know if you've heard that before but the first 20 minutes of your presentation I was there on the trail and I could visualize it. You didn't need PowerPoint, you didn't need slides, you didn't need pictures. Um, those are all great after the fact, but uh, from a storytelling perspective, you were absolutely incredible. So thank you very much for that. In recognition of your presentation to our club today, we will be um, making a contribution to the Polio Plus campaign of the Rotary Foundation to immunize 50 infants against polio. Because of you, Rotary is one step closer to a polio-free world. So thank you very much. Um, you're welcome to stick around for the rest of the meeting. Um, if you have another commitment or anything you need to go to, please don't feel obliged to stick around. So we'll let you, but thank you very much. Oh, absolutely my pleasure and thank you um and you know being that we were shut down for much of the winter last year speaking has kind of helped us care for our dogs so if you know any other organizations or companies our messages would serve we'd just be so grateful if you'd share our name with them so thank you and from our family to yours wishing you guys an amazing 2022 thank you so talking about polio, I did want to provide the club with a quick update. Um, it's been a few months since we talked about the Polio Plus campaign. Um, unfortunately, the end of uh, 2021 was not good news on the Polio Plus front. We went through most of the year with one case in Pakistan and one case in Afghanistan. Um, but then in October and November, there were three additional cases in Afghanistan. Um, a lot of it related to the turmoil in Afghanistan last year. Um, as the Taliban um, was battling with the government forces, um, there was interference with the Polio Plus campaigns um, in Afghanistan. And so for about five or six months, there was no vaccinations um, for polio taking place. Um, when the Taliban took over the government, um, in Afghanistan, the vaccinations have resumed. So that is good news. And hopefully the good news that we started with last year will kind of carry forward to this year. And hopefully we can get down to single digit or stay in the single digit numbers in both Pakistan and Afghanistan and get that down to zero. And at that point we will have eliminated polio from the world. So that is good news from a big picture perspective, bad news in that the really good positive um, motion we were seeing last year, um, we did have some additional cases um, towards the end of the year. Um, I think that's it from a Polio Plus perspective. Um, I do have a few more announcements 
or Diane, I think you have, you're here for your food bank announcements. Anyway, hi, everybody. <laughs> you're just going to have to look at my picture. So thank you to everyone who has um, stepped up to volunteer at the food bank this coming Wednesday. We have eight people. Um, they um, will allow 12. So if there's anyone else that would like to come out, um, just let me know. And um, on February 19th, we have six signed up and we can have six more. So if uh, those opportunities open up for you, please uh, send me an email and I'll put you on the list. You do have to be double vaxxed. Thanks. Uh, clarification, uh, Diane, you said February 19th. Is it not February 16th? Oh, sorry, February 16th. It's on oh, the okay. screen there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I see it there. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Good. Sorry about that, everybody. I do have one district event to uh, remind everyone of. Um, next Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., um, there will be a, our mid year town hall meeting to hear all the different things that Rotarians in our district are doing, as well as you'll have an opportunity to meet the district governor team and hear the latest Rotary news. So that is going to be a Zoom event uh, next Tuesday. The link for it will be in this week's COG and the details are also on the district website. Um, if you are interested in attending that. I, I was just going to say, I, this morning I sent out the notice to everybody about the Paul Harris Fellow, uh, the uh, Community Recognition Award, and uh, looking for nominations, uh, all Rotarians, uh, be they active or active satellite members, uh, can nominate. Um, uh, people who do not... Uh, uh, qualify are people who've been who are in Rotary, be it our club or another club, and who uh, have received the Paul Harris Fellow recognition to uh, from us in, over the years. But if you want to fill in the nomination sheet and get it back to me, uh, when I get it all, I'll send it on to the committee, and the committee will then put together their recommendation to the board. Uh, so it's a very prestigious award, uh, thanking people for the. Uh, volunteer work they've done in the London and area community uh, or national, international or national, uh, any of that kind of thing. So please read it carefully and uh, take, take the time to nominate uh, someone uh, that you think would be a worthy recipient. So to wrap up our meeting, next week's meeting will be Mystery Furtado um, talking about Type Diabetes, which is a special program or a nonprofit that she started uh, with respect to diabetes. <laughs> um, tomorrow night, the Satellite Club will have Mirna Ignalis talking about the district grants process. And our club will have a board meeting at five o'clock on Wednesday night. And as always, tomorrow at five o'clock will be our president's cocktail hour. And Thursday, 10.30 a.m. will be the coffee clutch. So hope to see everyone again at some point this week, whether it's the cocktail hour, coffee clutch, or the board meeting, or even at the satellite meeting if you want to learn about uh, the district grant process. But uh, that is everything for today. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>